listening to another episode of the Business of Aesthetics podcast series brought to you by our gold sponsor, AMP. AMP innovates your aesthetic practice. We also want to thank our silver sponsors, Eilise Works and Pronox. Today we are going to be speaking with one of the finest experts in aesthetics. Our host, Jeffrey Richmond, is an award-winning 20-year veteran of the aesthetic industry whose passion led him to co-found the Business of Aesthetics community. Over to you, Jeff. Good afternoon, and welcome to another edition of the Business of Aesthetics podcast. Today, we have a terrific guest, Dr. Alexander Rifkin. Dr. Rifkin is a um, uh, most known to us, I think, for non-surgical, for injection techniques. I uh, think non-surgical nose job. I think of that little um, uh, kind of pointy nose that people want that we've been able to sometimes get with filler now and um, credit doctors uh, like Dr. Rifkin for, for bringing us these. I'm especially excited to talk to Dr. Rifkin today about uh, non-surgical techniques, but he's also really, um, I want to say mastered, but I think he'll, he'll disagree with that, but has been one of the best at evolving with changing times and social media and the use of the internet. So I want to address that with him, but Dr. Ripken, thank you so much for for joining us today. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. It's been, it's really, it's nice to be here. So, and you've been uh, participating in the Business of Aesthetics group as well and been aware of that. I've seen your name. Um, We're we're excited to have you. Those members in the group, I think, can interact with Dr. Ripken that way as well. But can we just start with how you, how uh, someone that trains in otolaryngology that trains in head neck surgery ends up in a non-surgical aesthetic practice for the last what two decades now yeah it's been a while um <clears throat> yeah i had a bit of an unusual course i uh, <clears throat> my training so i was on the east coast for medical school and then i came out to um the west coast to san diego for residency and then i just and then I came to LA because I wanted to be in LA and, 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 and live here and start and have uh, my life here. Um, and I kind of, and, and, and when I came out here was when this field was just, just beginning. All these products that we, you know, that, that we, t- we use now are just getting FDA approved. Botox and Restylane were just, uh, had just been FDA approved. And I've always been interested in aesthetics and creativity. Um, and I saw it as an opportunity really for, to be creative. And as one of the only opportunities in aesthetics really to be creative and to be, um, to be artistic, but also an opportunity to explore something that's brand new, right? Something that nobody's ever seen before an ability to really change significantly change the face change the contours of the face without going through surgery i thought that was something that was i thought that was something that was very exciting and i wanted to be at the forefront of it so i really jumped in with both feet and started my practice as exclusively uh non-surgical procedures and so and that's and i've and I was, I think I was, you know, considering doing, you know, kind of mixing surgery, um, you know, into this, but then it just kind of took off and I never, I just didn't have time to pursue the, the, the surgical stuff. And I just, you know, this is the way, this is the way it's been for the last, you know, 18 years is just a real, and, you know, and at the time, and, and one of the things about sort of marketing and, and you know, and, and developing a brand is that I knew you couldn't, you can't be all things to all people, right? You can't do, you can't be master of everything. And so I decided that what I really wanted to do was, was to be um, a pioneer in the non-surgical field, as opposed to being just another, you know, ENT guy, um, you know, doing, doing ENT procedures. So I really went, went in, went in for that. And then and then 
I had a patient, it's, just, it's funny, I had a patient who was a friend of mine um, who wanted just a little bit of Botox or something like that. And I was using, and at the time, I think, I, I don't, I'm not even sure that there was, I don't think Restylane was even, a, no, Restylane had just become FDA approved, but we were still using collagen to a significant degree. And so um, I said, you know, because I had just, you know, I'd been doing, in, you know, in training, we'd been, we'd do, we'd done, you know, that, that kind of thing. And so I knew how to look at someone's nose and, and, and figure out what I wanted aesthetically from uh, someone's nose. And I said, gosh, you know, these fillers, I bet you I can make your nose straight because she had one of those bumps on her nose and her tip was coming down. I, I said, I bet you I can make your nose straight with just injecting these fillers. And she said, you know, I've been thinking about rhinoplasty for a long time, but I never really, I, I just don't care that enough about it, about my nose to do it. And it's just, it seems like a big expense and just, you know, a lot of downtime. It's just a big hassle and I don't want to do it. But if you can do this with an injection, that'd be great. So we did it. Her nose looked perfectly straight. And I became, I was really excited because, you know, there's then the, these longer lasting fillers became approved. I went into the literature and looking for this non-surgical rhinoplasty technique and there was absolutely nothing. I asked people that nobody knew anything about it. So as, as far as I know, in 2003, 2004, I was the first one to do this procedure, at least in the US. I'm sure there were some people doing it in Asia because they'd had these fillers longer, um, I, I assume. But I was the first one to do it here. And it was, and it's funny because when sometimes you just kind of, you do, some, you, you do something and you know it's going to be a, a big deal. You just, there's just no, there's no doubt in your mind that this is something like an actual, a door has been opened and you've opened that door. And that's pretty, that's, that was pretty cool. Like you, know? you, you looked at the patient and you were, it was one of those. Yeah. The lights open and everything that, the, right. The clouds roll away. And I mean, yeah. she looked great. She loved it. You loved it. You just, you knew right away you hit a home run. Yeah. Cause I'm like, why would you, I mean, at, at that point it became an almost an ethical responsibility, a moral responsibility to say that to, to, to run with this as far as possible, because here's all these patients that are getting rhinoplasty where, you know, going under the knife and with downtime and all this kind of stuff. And I mean, where you can do this in five minutes with an injection, you, you got to give them that option. That's, you know, saving patients, all this, all this surgery. That's, that's great. So it was, it was, you know, it was a nice thing that I went, then we went on the, on, so then I figured, okay, I got to get this out there. So I went, hired a PR firm. We got on the Today Show and all this kind of stuff. And so it was, it became a thing. And now everybody's doing yeah. it. I was um, speaking to Dr. Daniel Kaufman the, uh, last week. And he, you know, he was talking about how he, I was, you know, how'd you figure out after you hung your shingle, how'd you figure out what direction your practice is going to go? And with his comment was, you know, I pursued my passions and then you have to look at what patients want and what comes to you too. You have to take what comes to you and pay attention to that. And it sounds like in your case, that was actually what happened. It was no, that's you had this idea and passion and yeah. And then, and people really, you know, and, and it's, yeah, I mean, it was funny because when I, you know, I'd go on the, on the, at first, like, I think I went on the local news at first. And nobody's ever nobody, nobody had ever heard of this procedure, of this kind of thing that was possible. And we got just like flooded with phone calls about people saying, "What, you know, what is this? Can it, is is this re, is this is, is this true or is this kind of like a scammy thing? Like what what's what's going on?" And so, but it really uh, it took off. It's just it's just something that really resonated with me and it really resonated with patients and um and really resonated with physicians because now everybody you know i have five friends right now that don't love their noses but don't hate them enough to go get rhinoplasty so i mean it's it's right there within that vein i mean can we just talk for a few minutes about 
we have a lot of um, aesthetic extenders that are part of our group. We have a lot of uh, physicians that are still doing their own injecting. Who's a good candidate for it? What do you look for? Like, can you just spend a couple minutes and share with us your expertise on if, you know, is it dangerous to get into the nose? Should I do it first? Should I do it last? Uh, you know? Sure. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Um, the nose is the most dangerous place to inject filler in the body. No question. Absolutely. Number one, big like, and it looks really easy. You go on Instagram, all these people are injecting noses. They, uh, you know, they're talking about how awesome and incredible and mind blowing it is. And it is, it's a great procedure and it's great when it goes well, but in this low percentage of times that it doesn't go well, it goes really, really, really badly. So, I mean, if you see, you ever seen the pictures of patients out in, uh, from in Asia or, you know, even here, but this has happened more in Asia where patients go blind or patients get necrosis. Um, they, they're ner it's just, it's, it's really bad. And so if you're going to do the nose, and this is something that I talk about in all, in every time I speak about the procedures, if you're gonna do it, you better make sure that you are an expert injector in every other place, that you, um, you know, you know how to inject. So basically that you know everything about the anatomy involved, you know how to, the technique, how to inject the nose, you know the, what filler you're gonna use and what they're, how to use it well, you know what the tools that you want um, to, you know, to use that are optimal. And really importantly, you know what to do when something goes wrong because there, you're not gonna, if something goes wrong, there's not time to go to your computer and like do, you know, Google search and what do I do with, you know, if I've got a necrotic nose, you got to know what's going on, what, what to do. And so, and if you takes, I mean, it's, you know, you can put it, you don't have to have it memorize, you can put a sheet on the back of your cabinet door and just consult it if you feel like, if you feel nervous about what to do, but you better be prepared on, you know, in terms of what to do. And that's, I mean, that's something that is true for any area of filler that, that people inject, but in particular, it's the nose. So I think that's, that's really important as a first kind of step when you're, when people, when you're thinking about it, because it's not, it, it's, it's the Insta, Instagram makes it look like, you know, fairy tale land where it's just like people come in and you like the injector waves this like magic syringe and they come out with a straight nose and everything's hunky dory and they say it looks, it looks like post rhinoplasty three weeks post when the bruising goes away or six weeks. But I mean, that's what it looks like. And so, and it's, it's, and it is, it's great when that happens five minutes later, you look like you've just had surgery. Well, you, you look like you've recovered from surgery and everything looks wonderful. And it, all it took was five minutes and a little, little injection, but when it goes wrong, it really goes wrong. So you have to be really careful. Um, but I, but the, uh, what well, the other, I mean, but who's a good candidate for the procedure? I think that, um, there's a lot of different, okay, so first, okay, so that's one first word of warning. The second word of warning that I always say is, I've done a study, I just did a study where I looked at two and a half thousand patients, our first two, and my first two and a half thousand patients. And what comes out, I just looked at the study, and I looked at the safety of it. So where's, where do we get adverse events? In what situation? Under what conditions? And stuff like that. What came out from the study is there's two, basically two main situations where adverse events go up. Number one is if the patient has had prior rhinoplasty, and so it's operated on nose, so the anatomy's changed, um, the blood supply to the skin is different, uh, the vessels are a little bit more fixed, and so you have more chance of is ischemia, necrosis, you have more chance of something going wrong. And if you're, if, for me, it, it's when I did, when I, you would use two different fillers. So when I tried to do use, a HA filler, and that wasn't enough lift, and then I brought in radius, for example, those kind of patients would get more redness and more kind of more issues, small issues, just because I'm using more product. But the most important thing is post rhinoplasty patients are, post rhinoplasty patients in general are particularly dangerous. 
So you have to be an expert injector to do to inject the nose. You have to be an expert nose injector to do post rhinoplasty patients. So, you, so really, people need to be careful of those because the, that that's where things go wrong even more, much more easily. So, who's a good candidate? I think that um, patients with mild to moderate contour issues are good candidates. Um, patients who need specifically, you know, and it's funny because I can't, it's, it's hard to say it in a formulaic way because it's different with every patient, right? So some patients, you know, a guy will come in with a big bump and he'll say, I want this procedure. And the first thing I say is, you know, you really, I think this is, you're not the best candidate for this procedure because it looks like you really need reduction to get a straight nose. You don't really, this, I mean, I can, this procedure can help, but I really think that you need kind of reductive surgery. And the, if you really, and then what, as I get to speaking to him potentially, um, he'll tell me, you know, surgery is just off the table. I'm not gonna get surgery no matter what. It doesn't, you know, I don't, I don't care enough to get surgery. Uh, I don't wanna go through the downtime. I'm not, I'm just not getting surgery. So whatever you can do to give me a good enough nose, that's great. And then I do it and it's like far from perfect, but it's better than what he came in with and he is blissfully happy. So who are the best candidates? You know, it could be anybody depending on their expectations and depending on kind of what they want. But there's, um, there's not many noses that this procedure can't improve. And there's right. a lot of this procedure can make totally straight. And, so, and you and you have the skill set to walk through realistic outcomes with those patients, so you can set a proper expectation and then get that patient's agreement. I guess at that time, so right. I mean, that's it, it's not always going to be a surgical outcome, non-surgically. When it so there's a, I mean, that's a third danger there too, right? Is overselling the capabilities of the procedure to the patient because. And it may be not maliciously. It may just be that you don't have the clinical experience in the beginning to know. So how does one, so, I mean, what I'm hearing here is a couple of things. Unless you're an expert in, if you're an expert injector and you're looking to add to your repertoire, this may be something you can add to your repertoire. If that's the case, how would I go about doing that? And if that's not the case, what I'm hearing is, like if you're a newer injector, this may be something you aspire to do later in your career once you get more experience and you need to search out a Dr. Rifkin in your area to refer those really specialized patients to. Um, I, I think so. I mean, I, I really think so because it's just, I think people really get in, it's, it's, yeah, I think people can get really in trouble very easily if they don't, if they don't have a good grasp of injection techniques and pride in the products and the anatomy and stuff like that. If you're an injector who's really, who's expert and who wants to add this to their repertoire, I think it's a wonderful procedure to add to the repertoire. But I think that of all the procedures, you can't wing it. You can't, I wouldn't wing this one. You know, I mean, you can wing like cheek injection. You can watch a bunch of videos. You can wing like lips. You can watch a bunch of videos and do that kind of thing. This particular procedure, I would go in and watch someone do it. I, you know, and I'm happy to do that. I have people coming, come, you know, come in and visit and kind of we have, we organize days where it's like basically all, all noses all day long. And we just go through it and we go through the, not just the, because the mechanics of it is not complex. It's the thought process behind it. Like, what do you do and what do you not do? What are the decisions that I make on a second by second basis as I look at someone's nose and as I say, okay, I can do this, I can't do this. Okay, now I'm gonna go here. Okay, that's enough here. Now I'm gonna go here. Because when it's not just like when where you inject, when you inject, it's when do you stop injecting and what do you, you know, when do you go to the uh, to this to the next location and how do you kind of how how do you how do all those injection points combine together? to make a, uh, a very pleasing contour, a very pleasing hole, you know, and that fits within the rest of the person's face. And that really kind of, you know, well, I mean, for example, these people with, uh, they come in and they have, they say, oh, you know, I have a big nose. I want, I want to, 
I want to make my nose smaller. Um, is there anything you can do? And I'm like, well, you know, I can't, op- I can't, I'm not going to operate on your nose, but if you want a rhinoplasty, I can recommend you someone. And they're like, no, 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 I don't want to, I don't want a surgery. Is there anything you can do? And I, and they have a bump. And the interesting thing that I say is that, well, you know what, the one thing I can do to make your nose smaller is to, is to add to it. And they're like, what, what do you mean? And I, and I explained to them that when you make your nose straighter, it basically a curved nose or a bumpy nose looks bigger because the curve or the bump attracts uh, visual attention. If you make the nose straight, the nose blends into the rest of the face and looks smaller. And that's something that I was actually, I was looking at the, my pictures like in back in 2005 in 2006, and I was noticing this and I'm like, wow, this is really cool. If you make the nose straighter, it looks smaller, even though you're making it bigger. And so these are the kinds of things that I think are useful to look at live and to watch someone do really do this. Do you, um, so are those preceptor programs uh, like training courses that you, you offer? Yeah, it's just, I mean, it's a pre-search. I, I've, been, I've been too lazy to actually put together a formal course, but it's preceptorships that we, uh, that we offer in the clinic. And so people arrange these kinds of things. They just call, you know, with, you just call my office manager and it's really, it's easy to set up. How, how is the best, uh, either over social media or phone number or email, what's the best way for people to reach out? Any way they want. It's, you know, we monitor our social media all the time. We, <laughs> Go ahead and give them so we, we people can get them. Oh, sure. So it's Instagram. It's Dr. Rifkin, Dr. Rifkin, or uh, Rifkin underscore aesthetics. And then the phone is 310-443-5273. And we're, you know, we're here in Los Angeles, in Brentwood, uh, of Brentwood and Beverly Hills. We have two locations. I know, I know you just got back from uh, speaking in Monaco. Are you, are those types of, um, events, good ways for people to learn or only to just kind of dip their toe in? Oh, I think they're good. They're, those kinds of events are good. I think they're good introductions and I think they can certainly pick up very valuable um, advice, especially in those kinds of settings where it's several, several experts speaking about one topic from several different perspectives. Like in my sessions, they had you know, some guys from Italy talking about cannulas, doing, you know, doing filler in the nose with cannulas, um, you know, somebody else from Germany, somebody, you know, and it was very interesting to hear all of those different perspectives. But I think it's never enough. You have to go in there and you have to go in and actually, you know, watch someone doing it. And if you can, would be really optimal is if you can go in and have the person watch you doing it. That's really like, that's really where you, because you can watch someone doing it and you can be like, yeah, okay, okay, that's great. I really know this. I can do this. And then when you face with the actual patient, you, you realize actually in the moment when you have the needle uncapped in front of you and ready to inject, you realize in that moment just how much you actually don't know and what you should have, you wish you would have asked all these other kinds of questions. But yeah. when you project with the person hovering over your shoulder and you know telling you, no, not there, over here, not there, over here, I think that's the best learning experience of all. Yeah, I think every provider has been standing over a patient with that come to Jesus moment where it's, you're there and the curtain's about to open and you either know what you're doing or you don't, you know? Yeah. Um, I, just before we move on from this subject, this is the business of aesthetics. Are you charging similarly based on vials and quantity or are you charging on time or procedure or how do you do that? I charge on procedure. I think this is a light, I mean, I consider this to be, and my patients consider this to be a life-changing procedure. Um, it, I can do it with using temporary fillers or I can do it using permanent fillers. And it doesn't take, the amount of filler that it takes to do this procedure is non-commensurate with the kind of impact those, that small amount of filler 
has on the patient's aesthetics and on the patient's confidence and, um, and, and really in their life. So I charge for my expertise and I charge for my experience, uh, for my expertise and just my, my skill. And so it's a procedure charge, but what I do, I really want them, I, I want to have the, I want to be able to promise them something and I wanna deliver every single time. I wanna hit the bullseye every time. And so every time I have them uh, come back twice for touch up, uh, touch up visits, uh, at about two months is the first one, and about seven months or so is the second one, because I want to make sure that that contour that I create stays stable over you know a year and a half or so at least. So that's for the temporary filler, and then for the permanent filler, that's gen I use Bellafill, and that's for you know two to three sessions generally gets you gets us where we want to be but so i really want to and it's the same kind of thing where it's the a procedure cost um yeah and i really i the, my because for me it's it's i never want to promise something and not come through i'd much rather under promise and over deliver so i really want to make sure I, that those results the procedure cost. i think what you're saying is on those revisits they're not spending more money that's included in the procedure so it's it's the how much product you're using is irrelevant it's getting to the it's getting to your your goal is i think that this is the thing is that there's certain areas in general that i charge procedure costs so the nose is one the eyes are another right because in that because again it's the same kind of thing a small amount of filler is having a big impact on the person's face on the person's aesthetic on the person's confidence and so and it's a difficult area to inject, so I'm charging for my expertise and my skill. Um, so the nose and eyes are the same kind of thing. But, you know, there's, and I don't know, I mean, I have a certain philosophy about whether you charge for the, for the procedure or whether you charge per syringe. Um, in other areas, for example, the cheeks or the chin or the jawline or that kind of thing, and there's, there's people that charge as a procedure cost for those areas as well. Now in those areas, you're using a lot of filler. And I actually don't like to charge for as a procedure cost in that. I like to say, and I mean, I'm not, and I, I don't necessarily talk to them about, oh, I'm gonna use two syringes at a cost of X amount. And it's gonna be, you know, that's, that's what's gonna be. First of all, I don't, I don't talk about money at all. I have my assistant talk about money. But the other thing is that I don't, I don't want to introduce any kind of incentive to me to under to under deliver uh, filler. You know what I mean? Because if there is a procedure cost and I need you know a certain amount of filler in order to get a really good you know good result, I, I don't want it to be in my mind. Oh my God, I'm using up. I'm using all this filler. I'm only getting this much. And I, I need to like not use this. I know I need to use less filler in order to make more of a profit. I don't mm -hmm. kind of incentive to be to be present. So I just generally say, okay, look, you have a your chin is it's a little bit back. It's not too far back. I can probably do this with one syringe. Let's 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 do one syringe. We'll take a look at it. If we need another one, we can always you know we can do that. You know what I mean? So I want to be upfront with everybody with patients and and say that if you don't need a lot. You don't get charged a lot. If you need a lot, then we talk about what the charge is. You know, I'm actually of the school. I'd like to see us get more to a model where you're charging for the time and then the cost of the syringe is actually more relative to the cost because your time is. So if they needed additional, so, you know, it's it's $800 for me and then it's $250 a syringe for Versa or whatever it is, you know, um, because I. I, I, I really dislike how um, the injectable companies have monetized us as providers and secondly, have unilaterally monetized us based on expertise because I have somebody like you saying, don't even think about doing noses until you've mastered everything else. And then I have someone else that's just starting with everyone else and their cost per syringe is probably pretty similar. And that's, it's not right. So I'm glad to hear you say you're charging by procedure. Now, meanwhile, I think we have a, 
competitive issue in the marketplace that patients are used to be charged by syringe and yada, yada. But I, I like this idea that if they come back for, if they're charged by a procedure and they come back for a little bit of fill, um, yeah. they're not getting nickeled and dimed on that because they paid for the procedure. In the same token, it's like, it's opposite of what you said your worry was, which is now I can underfill, I can do as little as I think that is need possible because I know I'm going to have the patient back in a month. I'm not going to make her reach back into her wallet. I'm still going to deliver the result that I want. And, um, and she probably feels better about going through the process of coming to me three times to get to that result too. Absolutely. And I separate the syringe, I break up the syringes. So it's not an issue with me like, Oh, Oh, you know, I'm going to open up the syringe for each touch up. I, I you know, I'll break up the syringes into um, small aliquots using the 0.3 cc BD syringes. So I, I will backfill those and just set up a bunch of those things. And so I'll just grab one of those and use that. And that's, you know, that's not, and then I don't feel like I'm costing myself a large, you know, big money by doing, doing a touch up. Yeah. What yeah. other areas? So I know your injectables is the main focus. I know you have some uh, um, technology in your office as well, but what other kind of what other areas of your practice are large focuses? Are you mostly injecting throughout the day? Mostly, I'm mostly I'm injecting all day long. I'm not. I don't do. Um, I don't really do procedures. Uh, uh, sorry, I don't really do the the uh, lasers or devices. Um, we have some devices. Uh, we're not a huge device practice. But we do have some, we have Fraxel, we have the usual stuff. We have Althera, we have Thermage, we have Fraxel, we have um, Profound, we have uh, IPL, we have uh, vascular laser. Vascular laser is actually nice because uh, for bruising and for redness, because sometimes they do get redness from the tip of their nose when they, when they do this. Um, and what else do they have? I don't know, we're looking, and we're looking for, you know, I'm always looking for skin tightening. It's always like, it's always the thing. I don't have all I have, right? I mean, I, I tried the, um, that, that Sinusure thing. I forget what it's called. The side lace. It was, uh, that was, that was. Oh, cellulase for. Uh, yeah, for the face. Oh, uh, for the face. I forget what the name is, but it, that was, I was, I was sold a bill of goods by those guys. That was very frustrating. I, I, I know a lot of other, my colleagues would, you know, felt the same way. Um, so that, that's a very expensive doorstop. And then, um, but yeah, so I'm, you know, but there's some new technology that sounds kind of interesting uh, that we're looking into as well. Um, but it's, for me, it's, for me personally, and then I have a lot of, and I have a bunch of other providers. I've got nurses and nurse practitioners and PAs doing, doing uh, you know, the other stuff and also injecting. But for me all day long, it's these days, it's noses. You know, it's like, you know, it's seven, seven, eight noses a day. It's nice. Yeah, well, I mean, look, you it's a testament to the terrific reputation you've developed through your achieving optimum results over many years. I mean, I'm it's I don't think you just wake woke up one day and were terrific at this. You've curated a specialty practice doing a specialized procedure and you're great at it it's not too often i can say to a doctor tell me what you're best at the world at and they have an answer and you you have an answer i mean it's been a yeah it's been a long time it's just kind of refining the technique choosing okay well it's which product which syringe how do you do it how what's the you know do i use a can all those questions are constantly on my mind constantly refining the technique so it's been, yeah, it's been a nice ride. So let's, so can we just spend our last few minutes together talking about branding? You've done a, uh, I think a lot of it has been organic and your willingness like this to share information with larger communities. Your, uh, it's obvious to me that uh, educating the kind of the greater community is of importance to you. So I think some of your brand and growth has come from that sharing but you you do have marketing people working for you you're not uh, immune to this idea that social media influences and other things um, social media i think influences um uh, uh patients much more than it influences physicians these days but 
Um, yeah, talk about how you've built your brand and is that continuing to deliver you patience? Yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, because in Monaco we had a panel on social media and one of the things I really wanted to communicate to everybody that was listening <clears throat> was that this kind of idea that you can do it on your own, even like if you're just talking about social media, never mind marketing the practice, is just it, it's it's not tenable. It's you, you can't do it on your own. You you just don't have it takes too much time these days, too much effort, there's too much competition in order to, for your message to rise above the noise. It just it's impossible to do it on your own. You have to, you you have to get other people involved. You have to get help, and and there's you know. But <clears throat> you also the the effort the where where what you can't delegate is figuring out who you hire, like making sure that the people you hire to represent your brand and to represent your your business are doing a really good job and are are good enough to do it, um, have the energy to do it very well, and have the, the, have the, the skills to adjust to a changing marketing landscape. Um, and you have to, that, the, the effort and the energy from, on your part is checking up on them and making sure that they're performing you know, all the time. But you can't do it alone. It's really, um, it's hard because there's too many there's too many moving pieces, right? There's search engine optimization. There's PR if you're doing PR. There's uh, you know there's Instagram. There's influencers are inst on Instagram. There's stories. There's posts. There's I mean there's just there's a and and the content generation required to keep feeding those machines, right? It's a yeah. I mean it's it's an insatiable beast. Instagram is like this dragon that you have to feed. Because if you don't, it'll fry you, <laughs> you know? I mean, it's just, you, you have to, you, you have to keep feeding it. And, uh, and it has to be really good content. And so your pictures have to be really, you know, well lit. And they have to be, you know, good, you know, in good focus and in, in good position. And you have to like, and that takes energy and time. And so you need help. There's no way people can do it on their own. And the people that I, that I do see doing it on their own um, successfully. I don't know that they have much of a life outside of like the practice and their Instagram. Yeah. Except they're everything. Yeah, I think there's a younger crop of physicians that maybe have Instagram more um, uh, integrated with their daily lives because of the generation they grew up in, but that crop is just coming around. And I think once they realize the administrative uh, drag of running a business and they really develop their business, then that stuff will probably end up falling by the wayside. Yeah, I mean, I have a question for you. Um, just see what your, what your opinion is. So there's people on Instagram who our personality in our field, who are personalities and who have developed this kind of this, the, their brand is them, is their personality, right? And, and, and they, does that translate, do you think, into patient flow? Because what ultimately what you're trying to do, I mean, ultimately, Instagram is the marketing uh, avenue and it's, mm -hmm. it's Thanks nice for your ego and stuff like that, but ultimately you want to get patients into the seats. So, so I'm I'm always curious about that because these new people that are coming out, where Instagram is just kind of a part of their life and it always has been, maybe they can do it in establishing their personality on Instagram. But is that really going to translate into patients coming? Yeah, and it's a different style of to to answer you from my perspective. It's a different patient that you are looking for and that they are looking for. And um, I'll say it this way, there's um, all of digital marketing, all of all this effort, social media, social marketing, SEO, what we're trying to do is get people to know, like, and trust us. And 
so sharing some of ourselves with our patients is a way to get them to know you a little bit. Now, you shirtless climbing up a mountain, taking a picture of yourself doesn't make me like or trust you. But to a younger generation of people that are interested in the glam of Instagram or the, 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 the famous for three seconds or want to be with a celebrity physician for the excitement of that and they're going to blog and show their whole procedure and their lips afterwards and everything else so but i don't think that's your patient dr Rifkin. it's certainly not our patients up here in the northwest for for the most part um it's a segment of the the public so is it a way to do it yes i think especially in a city like la where there's a following but the large majority of people um, I, I think the, the large majority of people that have the dollars to spend in this marketplace um, also need to know and trust. Uh, I mean, they also need to like and trust beyond just know. Yeah, and I think, I think that's, that's true. And so, I, I, so that's why I think ultimately, even those people, even those younger uh, physicians are going to have to buckle down and actually, you know, get some help because, you know, they don't. It it still takes good, you know, putting out good befores and afters. You still have to, you know, have good good content within, you know, kind of, uh, yeah. I mean, you still have to put out good content. It's not just it, it, again. It's yeah. You're right. It's not just you climbing up a mountain shirtless. That's not going to make your practice. Well, and I, I, I haven't seen your shirtless on. Uh, uh... Yeah, that's uh, social media yet, but I have seen uh, lots of comments about how sexy you are from women admiring fans. So uh, there you go. Uh, Dr. Ripken, thank you so much for taking the time today, um, sharing with us uh, so much about uh, non-surgical rhinoplasty, which I think is just a huge emerging field as um, you and others continue to train more people like yourselves. And that's, I think, what it will require. I'm guessing the injectable companies aren't offering training at that level yet. No, oh, um, like there's off-label and there's this. They're like, it's like Siberia. They love that you're doing it. They just don't want to talk about it. Although, although interestingly enough, in China, Allergan is actually finishing up a non-surgical rhinoplasty uh, study. They're like doing a whole big, a whole big study there. So once they get the results from that, that'll be, you know, everybody will know about it. But here is just too much. They're too scared. Yeah, too much liability. And our noses are larger issue in Asian cultures. So I think there's a lot more, uh, you know, people who want to lift their bridge in uh, their, their nasal bridge um, in, in Asia in general. And so there's a, this is very, I, I think this is, a, like for, for us, cheeks are bread and butter. Um, you know, nasal labial folds are bread and butter. For in Asia, the nose is very much bread and butter for a lot of injectors. Yeah. Terrific. It's been amazing. I've learned so much from you today, and I hope our community has as well. If you're interested in getting in touch with Dr. Rifkin, follow um, him and his practice on social media you can uh it sounds like engage with them that way too i hope that uh you stud injectors that are really good at what you're doing that are looking for a new challenge uh reach out to to dr rifkin or another um uh, colleague and and go uh preceptor go um it sounds like maybe even if you could do it in state you could bring a, a patient or two of your own at some point, that would be be good. But um, if you like this uh, podcast, please like it, share it on Google, uh, uh, share with your friends, invite them to our community, get on our Facebook group, start asking questions. Dr. Ripskin's on our Facebook group. So if you have specifically injection or non-surgical alternative questions, social media questions, uh, testament to his great advice today, Dr. Ripkin would be a terrific person to reach out to. So thank you, Dr. Ripken. Appreciate you being here. 
Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks. Have a good day. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you for joining us this week on the Business of Aesthetics podcast series brought to you by our gold sponsor, Aesthetic Management Partners. AMP innovates your aesthetic practice. And silver sponsors, Eilis Works and Pronox. Would you like to join our growing group of aesthetic industry experts and get featured on the Business of Aesthetics podcast? Or do you know someone who would love to share their strategies for growth in the aesthetic business, providing quality patient care or their clinical expertise? Head on over to businessofaesthetics.org forward slash speakers and apply to be featured as a guest on the show. Remember to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Amazon Music, or wherever you listen. If you would like to engage with today's or any of our past speakers, join our Facebook group or LinkedIn group by searching for Business of Aesthetics. Thank you and have a great day.